evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Many in Louisiana are still without electricity and water after the devastation of Hurricane Ida. The feds offer help as President Biden confirms that he'll visit the state at the end of the week. The White House has a new plan to combat the rise in housing prices. That's increasing the affordable housing supply and changing states' zoning laws. But one congressman tells NTD that the federal government should not have control over local zoning laws. Bad news for families of opioid victims. The Sackler family is now shielded from all opioid lawsuits in the future. A judge approved their company, Purdue Pharma's bankruptcy plan. The Taliban is now in control of the future of the Afghan people. And it's facing many challenges as it steps up a new government. Secretary Austin and General Milley spoke of America's new mission going forward while the Taliban celebrates in Afghanistan. Have you ever wondered if you have a doppelganger? NTD spoke with a deputy sheriff from Alabama who could be Dwayne Johnson's stunt double. Hurricane Ida hammered Louisiana, leaving a trail of disaster and power outages. Homa was one of the town's hardest hit. NTD's Miguel Moreno has an update from the governor. The Louisiana governor gave an update on the worst storm to hit the state in years. In this press conference published by BR Proud, the governor starts by saying President Biden is set to visit. I've been informed that the president has accepted my invitation. He will be coming to Louisiana on Friday. I don't know exactly what time or what his itinerary is, uh, but I do appreciate the fact that he's going to come because there's nothing quite like uh, visiting in person. Governor Edwards says the state took a beating. Homo was one of the town's hardest hit, but the governor says there is hopeful news. And I am very careful about what I say, but, but there are certain ways in which we've been very blessed. As I stand before you today, there are two confirmed fatalities. And when you think about the sheer magnitude of utter devastation, the fact that that's where we are is, is miraculous. He also says the levees held up and the death toll may have been much higher if they didn't. According to the governor, Biden is offering the state federal assistance to get through the disaster. Edwards is asking Ida survivors to contact FEMA for individual assistance. Power has been restored to some areas, mainly in New Orleans. We interviewed a resident in the city. We had a tornado right here, took out the power lines about four miles that way, four miles that way. Uh, this wasn't the worst of it. You go just slightly north of Covington and they can't even have access to anything right now. Wow. Emergency anything. Flag never wavered. Wow. <laughs> it stood up the whole thing. And this tree, this is one of the largest pine trees on my property. The president of Jefferson Parish, a hard hit area, laid out the hard truth. Today, we're a broken community. It won't always be that way. Um, we don't have electricity. We don't have communication. We don't have gas. Our water and sewer systems are very fragile. She urged people not to return to their homes impacted by the hurricane. Instead, she wants people who can't sustain themselves to contact the government for help. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Just one week after the Supreme Court barred President Biden's eviction moratorium extension, the administration is now shifting attention to increasing the affordable housing supply. The White House today put forth a new plan to combat the rise in housing prices. NTD's Melina Weiskopf has more details from Washington, D.C. It's more expensive to buy a house today than it was a year ago. Home prices have outpaced income growth in 2020. This sharp increase in the expense of home buying is partly due to supply chain constraints brought on by the pandemic. But the White House says affordable housing is a decades-long issue that needs a permanent solution. The White House and agencies across the federal government, including HUD, Treasury, and the Federal Housing Finance Authority, are announcing steps that will create, preserve, and sell approximately 100,000 additional affordable homes over the next three years with an emphasis on lower and middle ends of the market. To do this, the administration will increase the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Investment Cap, which will incentivize enterprises to invest more in affordable housing development and rehabilitation. The White House plan also insists that states should change their zoning laws to create more affordable housing. Zoning laws are what regulates how land can be used, whether that's commercial or residential. 
The Biden administration suggests that these zoning laws are, quote, one of the most persistent factors depressing the supply of housing, especially entry-level and rental units. Imagine changing zoning laws in cities all across this country. Where is that the, the, the prerogative of the federal government to dictate that? Not only is the Biden administration calling on states to change their laws, congressional Democrats are trying to pass a law to force this change. It's included in the Democrats' latest $3.5 trillion budget bill. But Congressman Ralph Norman says he and other Republicans are opposed to Congress interfering with zoning laws, since it should be left to locals to decide. You know, government that, that, that works is government that's closest to the people. That's for the city councils. That's for the zoning boards. And for, for them to mandate this is, is another overreach. At least 42 cities in 33 states have publicly proposed deploying resources on affordable housing investments. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Do you know anyone impacted by the opioid epidemic? Victims of the epidemic will soon be able to receive compensation from the manufacturer of painkiller OxyContin. But the family that owns the company will be protected from all opioid lawsuits in the future. Federal bankruptcy judge Robert Drain ruled on Wednesday in favor of Purdue Pharma's $10 billion bankruptcy reorganization plan. An activist was protesting against the company in front of its headquarters right before the ruling. These people did not act alone. They pretty much created an ecosystem, okay, which included doctors, um, distributors, politicians, I guess judges, you know, top law firms, you know, and they're not acting alone. Purdue Pharma will be dissolved and a new company will be created. Purdue Pharma's owners, the Sackler family, will have to pay $4.5 billion. They are accused of aggressively marketing their painkiller Oxycontin while downplaying its overdose risks. The painkiller allegedly fueled the opioid epidemic. Families of opioid victims have been protesting against Purdue Pharma. Speak to what it is. They are opi opioid profiteers who have caused mass death and they sit pretty in this court and it's not right. But the Sacklers will be shielded from future opioid litigation. The family denied allegations that they are responsible for the epidemic. But their company pleaded guilty to criminal charges over how they handled opioids. So basically what they're looking at is, it's called the curtains. There's people actually are shielding, shielding them. So, and then that's how they're able to get away with it. Under this plan, the Sacklers will give up control of Purdue Pharma and government officials will appoint the board of directors of the new company. Company profits will be used to help victims of the opioid epidemic, which has killed half a million Americans over the past two decades. Five people are missing after a U.S. Navy helicopter crashed off the San Diego coast Tuesday. Search and rescue crews from the Coast Guard and the Navy worked through the night to try and find them. The Navy says the helicopter crashed into the ocean while it was doing routine flight operations. Six people were on board, but only one has been found so far, and he is in stable condition. Officials also said that five sailors aboard the ship were also injured in the accident. And it looks like Detroit's got a severe unemployment problem on its hands, at least according to a new study. An estimated one-fourth of the city's labor force is unemployed. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on that study. Detroit's home to over half a million people. A study from the University of Michigan estimates that the city's unemployment rate is at 25 percent. Looking at the data, the unemployment rate has slowly fallen from 27 percent in October to 25 percent this June, the most current estimate. As in many states, businesses like restaurants were bound to tight pandemic restrictions last winter, but they started to loosen up in February. Question is, why is Detroit's unemployment rate so high? Many of the trends that are uh, within the Det uh, Detroit metropolitan area are reflective of what's happening everywhere. Ira Wolf is the founder of Success Performance Solutions, an employee assessment company. He says a lot of businesses folded during the pandemic, hitting black and brown blue collar workers hard. But Wolf says Detroit's in a unique situation because it's dependent on the automotive industry, which has been hurt by a chip shortage. The other thing is Detroit's got a trickle down problem. Uh, the car makers, uh, and this isn't related to COVID, well, it's sort of related to COVID. Uh, without chips, you can't manufacture the cars. 
without a lot of the support, uh, the the other products that that uh, go into cars that re that rely on chip makers, um, they're laying off. So the automakers have slowed down production. Uh, a lot of their manufacturers, the supply chain has slowed down production. Um, if they're slowing down, then people aren't eating out. They're not going to entertainment. They don't have money. Expend them. They don't have money to spend. The Labor Department's official data says Detroit's metro area had a 4.5 percent unemployment rate in July. The university says its study applies only to the city, not the metro area, which is home to about 4.3 million people. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Colorado's Board of Health has voted to make vaccines mandatory for all of the state's thousands of health care workers. And the White House is calling on the public and private sectors to impose even more vaccine requirements, crediting mandates with driving up vaccination rates. NTD's Grace Coulter has the story. The Colorado Board of Health has approved a temporary emergency rule mandating all health care workers in the state to be vaccinated against the CCP virus by the end of October or lose their jobs. The mandate will impact the estimated 30 percent of the state's health care workforce who are currently unvaccinated. And the White House is touting the success of vaccine mandates in driving up vaccination rates and is calling for more. Here's the White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator Jeff Zeitz on Tuesday. The president first adopted vaccination requirements for federal workers last month. And now over 800 colleges and universities, over 200 health care employers, small and large businesses across the country, and dozens of state and local governments and school districts have stepped up to follow the president's lead. He said in Washington state, the weekly vaccination rate jumped 34 percent after the state imposed vaccine mandates on state employees, teachers and school staff and universities. And according to Indeed.com, a popular job search site, the number of job postings requiring vaccination are up 90 percent. The bottom line, Zeit said, is that vaccine mandates work. And we need more businesses and other employers, including health care systems, school districts, colleges and universities to step up and do their part to help end the pandemic faster. While mandates may be encouraging or forcing some to get vaccinated, they've also led to numerous protests across the country over the last few weeks. Many health care workers and university students have already been fired or disenrolled due to non-compliance with vaccine mandates. Grace Coulter, NTD News. A Michigan court has sided with four Christian female athletes issuing a temporary restraining order against their university's vaccine policy. This after the university refused to grant the athletes religious exemptions. NTD's Grace Coulter has the story. Four Christian female soccer players have won the first round in their suit against Western Michigan University. They allege WMU is violating their constitutional rights by requiring they get vaccinated or be dropped from the soccer team. The university required all athletes to get vaccinated against the CCP virus by Tuesday or be banned from intercollegiate sports. In a letter, WMU told the women the reason for the mandate and for overriding their request for a religious exemption was to avoid the risk of a COVID-19 outbreak due to unvaccinated participants. On Tuesday, U.S. District Court Judge Paul Maloney granted the four women a temporary restraining order, allowing them to remain on the team while their case is litigated. Maloney's order stated that the women's case had merit, writing that they've established a likelihood of success on their claim that WMU's denial of a religious exemption violates their right to free exercise of religion. Their case is set to be heard in the state's federal building on September 9th. Grace Coulter, NTD News. Now that America's longest war is over, Secretary Austin and General Milley announced that America's role in Afghanistan will transition from a military mission to a diplomatic one. They also showed their respect for the service members who died in the 20-year-long war. NTD's Jason Perry has details. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said he has never been a part of any mission that they didn't discover something that could have been done better, more efficiently, or more effectively. This department will look back clearly and professionally and learn every lesson that we can. That's our way. 
But right now, it's time to thank all those who served in this war. Because you are the greatest asset that we have. Over 2,400 American service members paid the ultimate price in the war in Afghanistan, and over 20,000 were wounded. Many are suffering with PTSD. Thousands of military contractors, hundreds of American allies and partners from NATO, and tens of thousands of Afghan soldiers, police officers, and Afghan civilians all lost their lives in the war. U.S. Armed Forces recently completed the largest air evacuation of civilians in American history. Those 124,000, they never knew the 13 who died, and they will never know the 22 who were wounded, and the thousands of dead and thousands of wounded who came before them. But they will now live in freedom because of American blood shed on their behalf. As the Department of Defense shifts its mission in Afghanistan, the Department of State will now lead the way in evacuating the Americans who remain in the country. General Milley was asked if he will work with the Taliban to help fight ISIS-K. He said it's possible. The international community will continue to judge the Taliban by its actions and not by its words, as the Taliban seeks to be recognized by the world as a legitimate government. Recently, the Taliban has been celebrating what it calls a victory over the world's greatest military by firing gunshots from the airport and holding military parades in Kandahar while riding around and showing off newly acquired U.S. military weapons and equipment. Jason Perry, NTD News. One of the Taliban's first big challenges will be forming a new government. They have promised to be inclusive of all Afghans and to allow women to keep basic rights, such as working and going to school. But it's not clear whether the Taliban will follow through on their promises. More from NTD's Jason Perry. After the last of U.S. forces left Afghanistan, the Taliban spoke at the airport and attempted to give hope for the future of the country. I call on all our soldiers to treat the people well, because the people have the right to peace, to unite. And we are the servants of the nation. We must not oppress the people. But many appear to be skeptical of the future under Taliban control, as Afghans continue to flee to bordering countries. Some of the Afghan women lived under the former Taliban government, and they have memories of women who were threatened and beaten for not wearing proper clothing. And you have the other segment of women who haven't experienced the Taliban, but they've heard all the stories, you know, or the horrific stories about how the Taliban were treating women. And a lot of them, they're staying home, that they don't dare to go out on the streets because they're scared, you know, because of their memories or because of the things that they heard. We spoke with an Afghan resident who believes what the Taliban have announced in their new take on women's rights. He wanted to remain anonymous for safety reasons. The girls that are students, will they continue to go to school or no? Yeah, yeah, they can go. So also to them, also they announced that every girl can go to school and they can uh, do the stuff that you were doing before. Do you think that's that's the truth? Uh, yeah, yeah. I uh, completely believe that it will be true. The Taliban will face many struggles, including inflation, as vegetable prices are already up by 50 percent, according to local vendors, and gas prices are up by 75 percent. According to a senior U.N. official, food in Afghanistan could run out this month. Jason Perry, NTD News. Coming up, sometimes celebrities leave hubs like L.A. or New York City to live a more private life. Is that what actor Dwayne Johnson did? Find out more in just a moment here on NTD News. If you've always wanted to meet a celebrity, then you might want to change your next travel destination. Dwayne The Rock Johnson might have moved to Alabama. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the story. Pretty sure that's Dwayne Johnson shooting his latest movie, right? Wrong. Meet Lieutenant Eric Fields of the Morgan County Sheriff's Office. He is going viral for looking just like the famous actor. And he told me that fame is actually helping with his job. And yes, I do take pictures. Uh, they do want to take pictures. And, and that's what I want to be. I want to be approachable. You know, now when I go out, they recognize me from everything that's happened. And it gives, uh, it gives me, especially as a law enforcement officer, a good relationship and, and able to make contact with my community in a positive manner. 
Eric's two kids, even though they're still young, have also realized that their daddy is in the spotlight now. I've got a seven and a six year old. And uh, my oldest asked me just the other day, uh, yesterday actually, he said, uh, Daddy, who's cooler, uh, you or the rock? I said, well, that's in the behind, that's the eye of the beholder. Dwayne Johnson himself decided to be the judge of that. He tweeted a picture montage of the two and ruled that Eric is in fact the cooler guy. So I read him with the rock said where he says the guy on the left, you know, cooler. And he said, the rock, thanks for So you're the coolest guy in the world now, daddy. At one point, Eric asked God, what's the meaning behind this sudden fame? He decided to use his five minutes in the spotlight to support his colleague who is sick. One year out from retirement, good man, 49 years old, he's got wife and kids and, and he's got this ALS that he's dealing with. A GoFundMe has been set up for Sergeant Dillard to help him in his battle with ALS. Arian Pastar, NTD News. One World Trade Center is standing tall and proud as one of the world's most magnificent buildings. But it wasn't easy getting here. 20 years ago, the world was devastated when the original Twin Tower buildings were brought to the ground by the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Hijackers from the terrorist group Al-Qaeda destroyed the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001. The terrorist attack killed nearly 3,000 innocent lives that day. Developer Larry Silverstein had just signed a $3 billion lease for the Twin Towers. It was six weeks before the towers fell. So that was, that was excruciatingly difficult circumstance, terrible, terrible time. Silverstein decided to rebuild after the attacks, but it hasn't been easy. He was already 70 at the time and was planning to retire. We were in the middle of a five-year litigation with 22 insurance companies to collect $4.5 billion, which the courts said we were entitled to, and they wouldn't pay. I said, I'm not a stopper. <laughs> I said, you're not going to convince me that way. I'm a New Yorker. I'm here to get this done. Silverstein had the support of his wife. After a $2 billion settlement in 2007, things started moving forward. We built this one, got this one done. It became financially, commercially, architecturally, superb success, terrific success. Today, the World Trade Center complex houses four skyscrapers, the Oculus Transportation Hub, and the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. And we're still not finished. <laughs> I'm all, but since I'm only 90, no rush, I have plenty of time. <laughs> Two more skyscrapers are on the way, along with a performing arts center and a national shrine. Phil Zoe, NTD News, New York. After several shots at cracking the New York City market, Walmart is teaming up with Instacart to deliver groceries in parts of the Big Apple. But that doesn't include Manhattan just yet. NTD's Evelyn Lee has more. Walmart wants to deliver groceries to its customers in New York City. The retailer is partnering with Instacart and launched the service Tuesday in parts of Brooklyn, Queens and the Bronx. That's a market the world's largest retailer couldn't crack for years. Santosh Rao, head of research at Manhattan Venture Research, says that besides permit issues, space also plays an important role for Walmart. They need huge, huge uh, stores uh, and they need warehouses and all that stuff. So it's kind of difficult in Manhattan. Walmart doesn't have any physical stores in New York City. So Instacart shoppers will buy groceries outside of the city and then deliver them to homes nearby. But this still doesn't include Manhattan. And they want to make that a moot mo mo point, essentially, because by online you can be anywhere. So I think that's the main reason they want to get into these big markets. New York City is a very influential market. Uh, there's a lot of money in here. According to him, online grocery sales grew 54% last year. And competitors like Amazon and Target are also competing for market share. He says Walmart started falling behind. The retailer offered grocery delivery in 2019 through Jet.com, but then halted it again. So what they're doing essentially is being preemptive, going, fighting back, and trying to win back the market share that they had, leading market share that they had in online grocery business. He says with Instacart, Walmart can now scale with an already established app and no legacy costs. A Walmart spokesperson says it will be using Instacart where stores aren't as dense to reach more customers. 
and Instacart has expanded its technology to enable longer distance deliveries. Evelyn Lee, NTD News. The Farm Progress Show is back in Illinois this year after going virtual in 2019. It's the largest agricultural event in America. Under the scorching sun, spectators admire the gigantic tilling machines as the 2021 Farm Progress Show commences in Decatur, Illinois. It's the largest agricultural event, largest outdoor farm show in America. All the latest and greatest technology is here. The show went virtual last year due to the pandemic. It is back in person this year. We're really, really glad to be back live. You know, you can't look at a piece of equipment. You can't touch it. You can't feel it. You can't visit with the engineer that designed that piece of equipment. Vendors are eager to show off their latest technology. Really new in our booth this year. We have this all new uh, Hagee sprayer here. It's 75% new from the ground up. Or lifting a barn in 10 minutes. Institutions come to connect with alumni and students. We're here at the Farm Progress Show um, connecting with alumni who have graduated from our college. And it's just really exciting to see the diverse careers uh, that they're in. Government agencies come to provide insights and knowledge. International trade is probably one of the biggest drivers of invasive species. The forest pests are, are introduced through solid wood packing materials. Um, so that's not even the product itself. It's the packaging that the product comes in. So crates and pallets and dunnage, that wood material uh, is what's actually harboring some of these. Farmers also come together to get their voices heard by Washington, D.C. and discuss matters such as the trade deal. One of our big concerns right now is what's going to happen at the end of the phase one uh, China agreement because that agreement's been so uh, such a positive thing for American agriculture. And climate policy. We talk about climate, bring the common sense to it in a, in a way that treats farmers as partners, not as the enemy. We can be part of the solution and we want to be part of the solution. The Three Day Farm Progress Show ends on September 2nd. Now may be the time to stock up on warm clothing. The 2022 edition of the Old Farmer's Almanac is forecasting an extra chilly winter for Americans this year. They've dubbed it the season of shivers. The Almanac predicts below average temperatures across most of the U.S. It says we can expect to see an extremely wintry mix with snowfall on areas in New England, the Ohio Valley, Southeast New Mexico, and even northern parts of the Deep South. The Almanac's editor says this winter could well be one of the longest and coldest that we've seen in years. And coming up, San Francisco may soon pay people not to commit crimes. It's one way the city's trying to reduce violent crime and gun violence. And a church in Southern California is set to receive hundreds of thousands of settlement dollars from Los Angeles County. The church left their doors open throughout the pandemic, despite the county's health order. More when we return on NTD News. Ninety percent of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epic Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit. Subscribe today and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today.
San Francisco may soon pay people not to commit crimes. This is part of the city's efforts to reduce crimes and gun violence, but some people are skeptical. Here's NTD's Eileen Ang with more. San Francisco is considering a new crime prevention strategy. It may offer cash incentives for not committing crimes. People in the program, called the Dreamkeeper Fellowship, would receive $300 a month to start. They can earn an additional $200 for meeting certain milestones, like getting a job interview or abiding with probation. Lou Barberini, a former police officer with the San Francisco Police Department, sees it as a social experiment. If there's no consequence for someone committing a crime, it, it doesn't remove the incentive to, to be violent. So I don't know how dangling $300 in front of people is going to stop their behavior and or how they're going to know who to give it to. Are they just going to give it to everybody or just the shooters? And how are they going to monitor that? How are they going to know if someone didn't shoot? If they're wearing a mask, how are you going to know if that was the person that shot or not? It's not like these people, you know, posted on Facebook immediately, I shot someone. Barberini believes the city government is stuck. Prosecution would be a great start. Because every shooter is not, they're, they're just not getting prosecuted right now. They're getting sent to diversion and mental health court and things like that. Some people in the city are also skeptical of the idea. Do you think that's actually going to help a place? Like, I don't know. Um, not to say that, like, these people who are making these rules are, like, bad or anything like that. I just don't think there's any proof that that's going to work. Like, that that's going to actually deter people from that, doing anything bad from, like... Yeah, crime and stuff. Like, are you going to give 500 bucks to the, everyone else who is, is, hasn't been a criminal? Like, how's that going to work? It just sounds like it's not going to work. I really think it's a silly. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, it's, it's that what they should do already. That why would you even need to pay somebody for them to not commit crime? That, that's just ridiculous. It will be funded through the Dreamkeeper Initiative, a program that aims to move $120 million from law enforcement into the city's Black and African American community over the next two years. A large portion of the first $60 million will go towards health and well-being, housing, workforce training, and guaranteed income. The program is set to start in October. Eileen Ang, NTD News, California. A board of supervisors on the West Coast approved a settlement on Tuesday to a church that remained open during California's lockdown orders. The board referenced the Supreme Court's strike on banning indoor church services, as well as the easing of lockdown mandates in June. Here are the details. Los Angeles County settled a lawsuit out of court to pay $400,000 to Grace Community Church. The state of California will reportedly match that amount, totaling $800,000 to the Southern California Church. The church's lawyer said in a Twitter post that she's pleased with the approval and that it's a total win for the church. The church's pastor, John MacArthur, said it appears that the county wants to settle this because they do not want a trial. In July 2020, California officials ordered 30 counties across the state to stop holding worship services. But several churches continue to leave their doors open during the lockdown, citing First Amendment rights and religious freedom. MacArthur countersued the governor and mayor a month later, declaring that his church has a moral and religious obligation to continue allowing congregates to gather to worship. Amazon says it's planning to hire 55,000 people over the next few months. That's equal to more than a third of Google's headcount and close to all of Facebook's. New Amazon CEO Andy Jassy says the, new, the company needs more manpower to keep up with business demand. The new hires would increase Amazon's staff by 20 percent. Amazon already has about 275,000 staff members globally. The positions Amazon is looking to fill include engineering, research science and robotics. These positions are mostly new to the company. Of the more than 55,000 job openings, 40,000 will be in the United States. The others will be in countries other countries including India, Germany and Japan. And coming up, one of China's top property development companies is facing a severe debt crisis. The amount of debt it owes is more than Finland's entire GDP. And gamers share their perspective after Beijing announces it's imposing new limits on the gaming industry, like how many hours miners can spend playing video games. That and more here on NTD News.
of China's largest property developing companies is deep in debt. What it owes amounts to more than the GDP of Finland at some $300 billion. If the company goes bankrupt, it would send shockwaves through China's economy. NTD's Don Ma has more. China's second largest property developing group, Evergrande, is in a debt crisis, and creditors are worried that the company won't be able to pay it off. Evergrande owes a whopping $300 billion in debt and contract liabilities. To put this number into perspective, $300 billion is more than Finland's GDP in 2020. The company has been trying to raise money by selling assets, but that's barely putting a dent in the debt. On Tuesday, the company warned of default risks if it doesn't sell more assets or renew loans. This debt is a result of Evergrande's highly risky business model. They will borrow loans to buy land, then develop and sell homes at lower margins for fast turnover. Evergrande would also sell homes before they are finished construction. But its debt situation has raised questions about whether it will have enough money to complete those projects. Many Chinese citizens have complained online that they have been waiting for months or even years for their purchased homes to finish construction. A China economist at Japanese financial holding company Nomura says Evergrande's huge balance sheet will have a real domino effect on China. Major companies like Evergrande are entangled in China's financial system. If anything were to happen to the firm, it would send shockwaves through the Chinese economy. There is speculation that Chinese authorities at different levels may step in to help with their debt. Shares of the company fell by close to 2.5 percent on Tuesday. Within this year, its stocks lost more than 70 percent of its value. Don Ma, NTD News. Beijing is stepping up its limit on how many hours miners can spend playing online games. But gamers have something to say about the change. We look at how they're responding to the news. Some young Chinese gamers are upset about Beijing's new rule. That is, no more than three hours of gaming per week for those under 18. A gamer in Beijing says he doesn't think the regulation makes any sense. Although it aims to help teenagers, however, the less you get, the more curious you'll be. He goes on to say that this isn't something authorities can control. People, in the end, can always play on another account or buy accounts from adults. Another gamer believes there's no need for Beijing's restriction. Because the Internet companies here are developing and gaming is part of it, I think if China resists it too much, it will restrain the development of talents. Authorities argue the rule is necessary to stop the country's growing video game addiction. The regulation is also part of Beijing's efforts to tighten its grip on Chinese society, especially on key sectors like the tech industry. A Chinese professor says gamers will always find loopholes in the rules. For example, account leasing, which means that adults rent accounts to young people, or modify mobile phones, or there will be human skin masks in the future. These are all possible. And in fact, what we see may be that parents themselves are willing to help children in the family unlock it as long as they have their permission. Beijing's latest clampdown deals a major blow to the gaming industry. China is one of the world's biggest markets for video games. And gaming developers like NetEase and Billabilly saw their stock shares drop after the announcement. Radical Islam is not only a threat in Afghanistan, but also in North Africa. Eight years ago, France launched an anti-insurgent operation there to quell the terrorist groups, but is now withdrawing its troops. The situation is similar to what happened in the U.S. with the U.S. in Afghanistan. We hear more from a geopolitical expert known for his research on Islamic extremism. Since 2001, France has been operating in Afghanistan alongside U.S. forces, with 23,000 troops deployed over this period. The military presence was mostly to train the Afghan army. 89 French soldiers died in the operation. Geopolitics and international security expert Alexander Del Valle has studied and written many books on the Middle East and Africa. He is known for his analysis of radical Islam. According to Del Valle, although France withdrew its troops from Afghanistan in 2014, the burden of the United States' failure is shared. 
no solution uh, is possible, no victory is possible only with repression and a military solution. You need to conquer the hearts of the people. And in this term, it was a big failure. The fall of Kabul and the U.S. withdrawal echoes another failure in the French fight against Islamic extremists. For almost eight years, 5,100 French troops have been deployed in North Africa for Operation Barkhane, which aimed to stop the spread of radical Islam. French President Emmanuel Macron on July 21st announced the gradual withdrawal of French troops from the region, set to be complete by the first quarter of 2022. Some experts say the lack of progress is a major reason for the withdrawal. In 2013, French troops were warmly welcomed by the locals in Sahel. But as time passed, there seemed to be no solution to quell the Islamist Hydra, Delvalli says. West Africa welcomed the French operation in 2012. One year after, or two years after, the people began to complain because we only had a solution consisting in bombing some people and killing many innocents. It's not possible to make a, a, a war without killing innocent. The growth of terrorist groups in North Africa and of the Taliban in Afghanistan are a relevant comparison, he says. All West Africa now is under the danger, the threat of radical Islam. And why? Because like American in Afghanistan or in Iraq, we were not able to, uh, to spread our values because there is a clash of values. Del Valle and other experts say the failure of the U.S. military in Afghanistan clearly shows the broader failure of Western countries in addressing the issue of Islamic extremism. Hundreds of thousands in Ukraine were killed during Stalin's repression. Now, near the city of Odessa, excavation work has begun on what could be one of the biggest mass graves from that dark period. NTD's Trevor Piper has more on this. Researchers began excavating near Ukraine's southern city of Odessa at what could be one of the country's largest Stalin-era mass grave sites. We hope to find over 8,000 people here who were condemned by the NKVD Special Troika to be shot. The graves, under what was until recently a rubbish dump, were discovered last month during construction work for an airport. Historians estimate hundreds of thousands of people in Ukraine were killed in the 1930s during a period known as the Great Terror under communist dictator Joseph Stalin, and 40,000 in the Odessa region alone. There are coins made in 1938 to 1939. We did not find coins issued later. It can be assumed that these coins belong to those who were buried in those graves. He says preparation should be finished at the end of the year, then exhumation work would start. Archaeologists want to find out if victims were killed at the site or if their bodies were brought to the graves after execution. People should see that our country is also striving not to close these difficult pages of its history, not to hide it, but to show the whole world. And this, above all, is our duty to those who died here. Odessa's mayor says the city plans to erect a memorial at the site. Trevor Piper, NTD News. Still to come, a Japanese artist using cardboard as her medium. Her work features in galleries around the world. We take a look in just a moment here on NTD News. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well rested in the morning. That's why I invented MyPillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial right now. Retailers have canceled my pillow. 
and to thank you for your support, I'm going to pass the savings directly on to you. Go to MyPillow.com right now to get deep discounts on all MyPillow products. For example, you can get my premium MyPillows regularly $69.98, now just $29.98, the lowest price ever. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. In Paris, the largest Triceratops skeleton ever found is going on display. It's set to be auctioned in late October, and buyers are interested. NTD's Joy Duguid brings us this report. Meet Big John, the largest Triceratops ever found. It is estimated to be more than 66 million years old. It is named after the owner of the land where more than 200 of the dinosaur's bones were found. The Triceratops is one of the most well-known dinosaurs in the world. Everyone knows the three horns of the Triceratops, the power of this animal from the dinosaur's golden age. The 200-piece skeleton is being assembled for the public to view before it goes up for auction next month. It's estimated that it could fetch up to £1.3 million. The name Triceratops means three-horned face. The skull of Big John measures 2.62 metres in length, is the biggest ever found. On the top of being the biggest specimen in size, it is also very well preserved. Up to 60% of the skeleton, which is incredible. Usually we just find the skull of the Triceratops in collections. In the fossilized remains of his bony frill is a gaping hole, a battle scar inflicted by a small arrival. Big John will be on display to the public from the 16th of September, before going under the hammer in late October. Joy Duguid, NTD News. A Japanese artist has spent the past decade perfecting her craft, making elaborate sculptures entirely out of cardboard and a little glue. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. Ten years ago, 19-year-old art student Manami Ono picked up a cardboard box for a homework assignment and made something that resembled a bicycle. Since then, she has made over 200 detailed sculptures, entirely out of cardboard and glue. I wasn't able to do it as successfully as I can now, but when I first tried folding the paper, gluing them and putting them together, the people around me praised me, saying things like, wow, we can make this. And that made me so happy that I have continued doing this style of sculpture until now. Her imaginative, lifelike cardboard sculptures gained a following in recent years. The inspiration for most of Ono's work can usually be found in popular culture, ranging from giant robots to small-scale tanks and fighter jets. Rather than relying on a precise blueprint, Ono simply draws a rough sketch on the cardboard to get an idea of the measurements before cutting out the design. She uses glue to hold her creations together, and sometimes a little water. I basically only make things that I like. For example, I make the things that I would really like to decorate my house with, so I have a preference in my mind. Her work has been displayed in galleries in Japan and abroad, but most of it isn't for sale. Instead, Ono often relies on custom sculptures that she is commissioned to produce. Ono's commissioned pieces have sold for $900 to over $13,000. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Dolce & Gabbana revealed their Venice-inspired Alta Moda collection over the weekend with a star-studded show and the city's famed St. Mark's Square. The Italian brand presented its equivalent of hot couture on Sunday. This as fashion shows make their return after a long hiatus caused by the pandemic. Models walk the runway in dresses adorned with Venetian scenery and jackets with giant shoulder pads, some decorated with the city's iconic Harlequin mask. The new collection featured over 100 looks made of precious materials, such as silk, velvet, brocade, and crystals. There were 450 guests in attendance, including film, television, and music stars who all wore extravagant outfits from Dolce Gabbana. 
the show was opened by a performance from Jennifer Hudson. Poor weather threatened to cut the event short, with hail coming down on the audience as models posed for the finale. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Don't forget to catch all of our programs on TV. NTD Evening News is on every weekday at 6.30 p.m. Find your local NTD channel at ntd.com slash TV.